Well, we might just kick it off now and I'll just introduce the sessions. Um, my name's Liam Flannerty, I'm a PhD student here and Carl's asked me to sort of curate or at least present these, these sessions in the musical library here. And when how I, I sort of kind of gave an introduction to the first session uh, yesterday by sort of saying that when when housekeepers asked me to do these sessions, the, I thought the rationale of them was, was a really good one, and that was that you know at conferences, I think we can all probably agree that the real thinking, the real dialogue and debate, and, and um, intellectuals intellectually stimulating moments don't necessarily happen in the formal sessions. They often happen, you know, in between sessions, in the morning tea, over lunch, over coffee, over drinks at night, over drinks in the early morning, or those sorts of things where people who haven't had a chance to talk for however many years or maybe never have can get together and really have a rapid dialogue about what's going on in their area. People who have you know, lots of experience in that area and are you know, pretty, uh, really um, sharp thinkers can, can come together and have this kind of dialogue. And so we thought, well, why not try to bring that kind of dialogue um, and that really stimulating um, discussion into the actual program itself and not let it just sort of disappear into the private sphere. Let's try to uh, generalize it as much as possible. And I think that's why, I think in, in your program, you'll read that this is named the intellectual part of the uh, World Forum on Music. So, um, so that's the rationale behind the, the musical library. And um, so this morning we have the session my notes. We've got we've got the session music and post conflict environments session number one. Session number two, I believe, is 7 a. 11 a.m. up in 2.14. And um, so, if you like what you hear this morning, um, you can you can go along to that tomorrow. Um, and so we, we have a, a a bunch of speakers here with with really you know, a wealth of experience and knowledge. Um, and so I'll just introduce them before I, I let Gillian um, kick off and share, share the session. So we have, we have Gillian Howell here, who's a musician. I've done a bit of research on everybody, so we'll see if this works out in reality. Um, musician, facilitator, and educator working in a diverse range of contexts. Uh, she was uh, founder and director of MSO's award-winning community outreach program until 2008, and since then has gone on to a successful freelance uh, career working with flagship groups such as MSO, ACO, uh, Australian Art Orchestra, AYO, and many more. We have Tan Sui Beng here, who is a uh, professor of ethnomusicology at the School of Arts, uh, USM in Malaysia. Um, she's an educator, composer, musician, author, music activist, and ambassador. Sui Beng has uh, played a key role in developing music curriculum and programs in both secondary and tertiary uh, levels in Malaysia. Uh, we have Rula Abu Baker here, who is um, Graduated as a social worker from St. Joseph University, is this correct? Or yes, I got, it is. is that right? <laughs> I'm just trying to find some input. Yes, um, and it has been a choral singer since 2004 and is the uh, manager of Beha Choir, is that correct? Um, and a board member of the International Music Council Ex for you? Ex board member. <laughs> All right, well. <laughs> and I've just spoken to Eugene, uh, Eugene Skeet here, who was. Uh, who lives in London but was originally from South Africa. He's a composer and percussionist and has been working, uh, been doing music in, in conflict regions for several decades now and he, in his own words trains classical musicians to loosen up and improvise. So <laughs> I'll leave it there and, and hand over to Gillian to um, chair and, and, and facilitate the uh, session. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Liam. Am I on the way? Okay. All right, I can't walk the, straight, the stage, unfortunately, so I'm going to just going to stand here. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming along to our session. It is one of two sessions on the, in this um, sub-theme, so um, hopefully we'll see lots of you again tomorrow um, at 11 a.m. Some of our speakers from tomorrow are also here right now. Um, as a chair and also a researcher in the area of, of music interventions that get started up as part of post-conflict recovery and reconstruction, I'm going to start um, our session by just giving a bit of an overview of um, really what I, what I found in the scholarly literature um, as far as music and conflict, uh, pro conflict, conflict related projects are concerned. And it's an interesting area to look at because there's often a lot of media attention on these sorts of projects at certain times, but there's um, not necessarily lots of um, long term sort of examination of, of what's going on in the work. And therefore, our, if you like the epistemology or the, how, what we know and understand about 
what's effective in this area of practice in music is not necessarily very well known or not necessarily very well documented. So we know lots of things anecdotally, and as musicians we also have many strong beliefs, I, I think, in, in terms of why we are drawn with our art form towards this kind of work, um, but there's not necessarily really strong um, scholarly uh, uh, documentation of the work. So I've been looking into that somewhat this year. We're a very practitioner-focused group um, for the large part across our two panels. So um, each of us will be able to speak further about the work that we do, as well as in our presentations, but in the discussion time that we have at the end. So looking forward to some really rich and um, fruitful discussions with all of you over the next two, this session and the next one tomorrow. So I'll just uh, give you a bit of a nod each time. Thank you. Um, so just as an introduction, I think we all believe here that music is important, or we wouldn't travel the world and, and come to, uh, to a conference as beautiful as Brisbane is, it's on the other side of the world for many people here, and on the north end of the country for me, I'm based in Melbourne. Um, I'm interested in the way, and I always have been interested in the way that music contributes to human well-being, to human thriving and flourishing, and that it's uh, something that is a very natural thing for people to be involved with. Often in the West we have uh, an idea of music being something that is professionalised, that is for those who are talented, there's a lot of subscription to this idea of talent, the talent, talent narrative, uh, but I believe that everyone has the right to participate in music freely, and we know that that's one of the IFC's um, five musical rights that were spoken about um, at our, our opening yesterday. So we can move on to the next slide. When we look at places of war and conflict, we know that many of these um, aspects of human well-being, qualities of human well-being, um, are in severe deficit because of the amount of suffering, um, deprivation, um, long-term um, effects of conflict and of uh, uh, the, the division that, that, that takes place in times of conflict and also following on periods of conflict. We know that a lot of those aspects of human well-being, such as being able to connect, um, being able to feel well in oneself psych psychologically, um, emotionally, those sorts of things are often hugely compromised and can, can take a long time to uh, recover. When we're looking at participatory music interventions, which is the area that I'm particularly interested in, so the sorts of activities that where people can actively take part, because in my music practice that's what I work in, um, we find, as I was saying, that they're not necessarily very well documented. We have interventions, projects that are started up by outside organisations. For example, Eugene and I met 15 years ago when we were both working in the city of Mostar, divided city um, in former Yugoslavia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, um, working for an organisation called War Child, which was at the time a British-based NGO, expanding out to be uh, have a number of different international offices, but had a commitment at that time to creative arts um, as a form of psychological, psychosocial support in war-torn areas. So War Child is an example of an international organisation bringing something in. But we also have uh, many, many, many beautiful examples of, of um, music work taking place to respond to the um, traumas of conflict and the damage that conflict um, inflicts upon people and communities that are locally grown. So they, they are developed locally, they, are, um, they thrive locally, they are supported locally. Um, sorry, that was uh, heading back. Thank you. Um, we do have um, with this kind of research where where it exists, it's, there's not a great deal of it, and it's often documented either by the practitioners or organised or organisers, or it is documented by practitioners a number of years sometimes after the events have taken place. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. Um, good reasons. Uh, good reasons to do with the task of leading this work being something that is often very overwhelming and very intense often very under-resourced and therefore there is not time during, while the work is taking place for that kind of research to take place. There's also not the resources in terms of funding to bring in outside evaluators or observers. But this does mean that our literature is also somewhat um, weakened by the lack of participant voices and the fact that the people doing the writing are often people who could be seen to have an interest in the work. So it's not in, in the work being reported in a certain way because they are the practitioners and they are the organisers. So this is not to suggest that there are um, untoward or dodgy things going on, but just to say it's a limitation of the field, it's a reality of this kind of work. And it means that when we look to it as, you know, from, the, from a research point of view to see what is out there, it is quite a limited amount of publications. The publications that exist come from a really wide range of disciplines. So we have writing from people in the fields of anthropology and sociology, uh, peace studies, music therapy, education, ethnomusicology and applied ethnomusicology, um, community development and community building, uh, peace studies, 
development studies, uh, in terms of international development, and so on. So where music and the arts are looked at, they do come in under a whole range, or look, looked at through a whole range of lenses. So now I'm just going to give you a bit of a look at some of the sorts of projects that um, I've found have been documented. So for example, there is some um, uh, writing on uh, music as a tool for conflict resolution and peace building. Um, health promotion, so spreading messages of health. There's a, a book written by an applied anthro uh, ethnomusicologist. Oh no, yes, that's right. Medical, medical ethnomusicology, I think, is his area of interest. Gregory Bars, have I got that right? Sorry, yeah, um, a book on called Singing for Life, Music and HIV in, in Post-War Uganda. Um, cultural regeneration, often in a time of conflict, there is also a, a group or a culture that's being repressed or oppressed or decimated or disappeared, as we heard yesterday in the um, sustainable music summing up. Uh, so this is a picture, an image from Cambodia where an organisation, um, Cambodian or living, Cam uh, Cambodian Living Music um, or Living Arts, has been working for quite a number of uh, years now developing um, supporting master performers that they've been able to track down, musicians, and, and helping them to uh, transmit their knowledge and share their knowledge with the younger generation to, in order for the culture, the cultural knowledge to regenerate. Therapy and healing. This is an image of Nigel Osborne, Professor Nigel Osborne, formerly from the University of Edinburgh, who um, was the incredibly active in the former Yugoslavia, but has since worked in a number of other parts of the world where war has divided communities. And he's, um, while not a music therapist, often works very strongly with the idea of music as a healing force. Education and skills, it's not always about the extra musical um, outcomes that are, that are possible from a music intervention. Sometimes it's also about learning music and creating opportunities to learn and play music. So this is an image here from the Afghanistan National Institute of Music. And if you, those of you who are in Tallinn, in uh, the fourth World Forum on Music, um, you may have met Dr. Ahmad Sarnas or seen the documentary on his amazing and inspiring work in Afghanistan. But that's very much about skills and development and creating education and learning opportunities as well as about regenerating culture and sort of rebuilding a, a culture of music in the country where it was banned. Also music often takes place focused on young people and looking at the ways of rebuilding communities but also generating youth leadership and um, bringing young people into an environment where they can really develop and nurture their skills as young leaders looking, for, looking forward to a future where things may be more peaceful, less divided or at least um, bring them into contact with, with groups that they may be divided from socially as a result of conflict. Also, I've found that there's often use of music as a symbol, and I've got here an image of the West Eastern Divan Orchestra from um, Israel-Palestine, uh, Daniel Larenborn's initiative. And in this kind of context, um, and I, I think uh, my colleague Raya will be able to say a lot more about um, this, approach, this kind of work when she speaks tomorrow. But it's often about, I think, music is often used as a symbol to, to demonstrate what may be possible, that when people come together and play music who are in division, who are in conflict with each other, something can take place that suggests that it may, what may be possible in the wider world. So it's, a, it's not necessarily having a, an immediate practical change in the way those groups can interact with each other because often the conflict is, is protracted or ongoing, as in the case in um, uh, Israel-Palestine. But, um, thank you. But it also is about bringing people together and seeing what is that they, uh, what may be possible in that microcosm of an orchestral situation. Christopher Small writes about music um, when we make music, we're enacting a ritual, and rituals are about an idealised idea of the world, and so the musicking experience, the activity of playing music with others, is in some way uh, an, a visualisation of the world as we wish it to be, an enactment of the world as we wish it to be, and it also gives us an opportunity to step inside that world and, ex and exist within it for a period of time. And so perhaps this gives us an insight into why music in these situations can be such a powerful tool. Music is very self-regulating, so it means that people can take part in a whole range of ways. You can take part just by listening, you can take part by being very, very active. There's a lot of space within a music activity for those ranges of participations, and that means people will do what is safe for them to do. Um, it's the shared music experience can entrain energy and emotion, so as we know in many, many different interaction rituals, this is something that can be very powerful in bringing people together and creating that sense of community that can have very long-lasting effects. And so therefore music is an environment that 
often creates a space that allows people to come together. And when people come together, then other things may start to happen. When we think about music interventions, we probably think about them like this, that we've got the participants, we've got the staff or the people who are working with them, we've got initiators, we've got close supporters, funding bodies, those sorts of things. You know, they're all interacting with each other and the music intervention is there in the middle. But what I think is actually going on, and in my work I'm looking at things in a slightly more um, a busier way, that there's actually a whole range of constituent parts to these systems, if you like. The system that, that is already in place with any conflict affected environment is a very complex system. And we have a whole range of people and a whole range of actors with a huge amount of agendas. And all of these are bumping into each other and moving around, interacting with each other. And as they interact, we're getting these emergent properties. So if we, if we think about complexity theories, which is something I'm using at this initial point to sort of understand or consider what I'm finding in my fieldwork and what I'm reading about. And this com complexity tells us that things can work in non-linear ways. They have a non-linear logic, which means that you can have a small input and have a very large outcome. You can have a very large input and not get the same results as you. If you have good results with a small input, a logical, um, a linear logic would say, you're going to have more good results if you have a really whole lot of that one good thing. You put that in a whole lot more. But in a non-linear logic, we know that that's not what happens. You can have too much of a good thing and that can cause actually a lot more damage. So I believe that a conflict affected environment is one that is a complex environment. And so we have all of these different um, entities, constituent parts, moving around, interacting with each other, changing in importance, changing in size or emphasis in that environment. And that's going to affect what sort of outcomes we get. So as I'm looking at these environments, I'm looking not just to see what are the immediate things that are evident, um, as outcomes from the projects. And often, you know, people will look at a, pro a particular project and see it as, um, and understand it through a certain lens. We're looking here to see how this music project is helping people with their sense of well-being and healing. Or we're looking to see how it's bringing communities together. But a complexity perspective would encourage us to also look for what else might be going on. What else is going on? What other things have happened in the longer term? And what, what insights have been gained by the people there on the ground? So my research is really trying to focus on those partic participant points of view and um, see what they can tell us about their experience of this so that we start to you know, enrich the, the field of knowledge that we have to bring in those voices and, and find out a little bit more about what actually happens when you take a music intervention into an, into a conflict-affected environment. Next slide. That's just a summary of what we can see in complexity. It's all about relationships between component parts rather than breaking the component parts down and sort of examining them independently and then imagining they'll all work together in a particular way. But also I'd say that in a conflict-affected environment, we're often finding other elements that are important. So um, the music intervention, as well as all those constituent parts, is going to be compounded by things like poverty, by unstable or dysfunctional governments, by very, very limited resources. And resources may be buildings and infrastructure, not just financial resources. Um, limited infrastructure is there. And then powerful outside influences. And a, an example of that is just thinking about working somewhere like East Timor, where I spent some time. And you have such a huge presence of international organisations for such an intense period of time. You know, we, it, it, it results in all sorts of things like the dual economy, but also about people's own ideas that they bring with them, their own constructions of music and what it is and what it means and who should play it and how it should be played and what kind of music and why. All of that can be brought in and imposed on an environment that's already very fragile. And already, you know, fragile means um, prone to or, or vulnerable to exploitation or vulnerable to strong influence. So, I'm going to leave us there, and we, uh, we're now going to hear from my colleague Sui Beng, Tan Sui Leng, from uh, Malaysia, who will um, talk more about her work um, in Penang, working with communities there. And we'll have time for questions at the end, so if you have particular questions, please note them down or hold them in mind, because we'd really love a fruitful discussion. Thanks very much. Sorry, um, I may have missed number, but try the number. Yeah, I did. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, I'm going to talk about inter inter ethnic uh, peace building through music and creative arts uh, activities and projects that I've been running in uh, Penang, uh, Malaysia, uh, for the past uh, 20, 20 years. 
Um, but before that, uh, let me just give you some context to uh, the type of society that uh, I, I come from. Um, Malaysia is, has a multi-ethnic population, meaning that there are Chinese who actually speak different dialects. So there are many, many types of Chinese. There are many types of Malays from different parts of Southeast Asia, different types of Indians, Indian Muslims, Eurasians, Arabs, and, uh, and many, many others. Um, but it is a plural society uh, which was created uh, because of the colonial policy uh, of divide and rule. So we, um, even though the different communities live side by side, you know, and they interact with each other in the marketplace or in the coffee shops or in schools, but they are, they actually live very separate lives. Yeah. And if um, some political situation or economic situation, you know, goes bad then you know, people will start to fight with each other. And so in 1969, we had uh, riots and many, many people died. So as a result of that, uh, the state has introduced policies to create national unity. But it, the, the, these policies have not actually worked and actually they have marginalized uh, minorities even more. So um, we think that in order to create internet ethnic uh, peace building, we need to educate young people yeah, from, from young. So what I want to talk about today is the development of a socially engaged uh, approach to empower young people in Penang to foster inter-ethnic peace building and to bridge culture barriers. Uh, so the methods and strategies uh, are used in the heritage projects, uh, I, will, I will talk about these strategies. Um, and the strategies are to raise awareness of the meaning and um, significance of heritage. Um, so through these projects, the, the young people learn to appreciate their own and other cultures through tasks like research, they have to do interviews, uh, observation, they have to do audio, visual recording, analysis, perform, you know, things that we as ethnomusicologists do. Um, but as a result of doing all these tasks, they become more inclusive of others because they have to work with other people who are doing this, they have to interview and, and so on and so forth. And they learn to bridge cultural gaps by crossing ethnic and cultural uh, boundaries. Next. Um, so the projects are located in the field, so we take them out of the schools um, so that they are not in front of their teachers or headmasters and so on and so forth. Uh, to widen the scope and relevance of information and the, the kids can also get their own information uh, in the city itself. So the young people begin to appreciate the diversity, cultural differences, you know, uh, so that they begin to avoid uh, ethnocentric uh, mindsets. And they, at the same time, they also learn about uh, traditions um, and, and they learn how to contemporarize these traditions so that uh, the traditions become more relevant. Next. Yeah, so um, our creative team and agencies, um, it will include uh, many, many types of people, you know, as Daniel has said, yeah. Um, we, we include multi-ethnic artists, we include youth facilitators, we include school teachers, we include local artists, we, and we also include um, clan associations. So these clan associations will formally um, taking care of the different communities, yeah? so, so we, we, we also include them, um, and as well as the staff and students of my university. Yeah, and um, the approach that we use is uh, oriented towards process theatre, which is aimed at the personal development of the child and the making of music and drama and, it, and its meaning by the children themselves. Um, we work with children from 10 to 19 years of age, uh, you know, from different diverse ethnic groups. Um, we, and they also come from schools, orphanages, um, people from the city, and um, so on. Next. So, what are the phases of uh, the workshop that, that we go through? First, of course, is warm up. So, during the warm up, they, they do group dynamics and games, and they get to know one another. Um, and then they go through a development uh, process where they, they are trained in improvisation, role play, movement, traditional music, dance, theatre. Um, and then we send them out to do research, uh, depending on the topic that we pick uh, for that particular project. Yeah? So the kids have to go and observe movement, sounds, um, they have to talk to people you know, about the particular subject. And then they come back and they create their, their own artworks. Uh, and these artworks are 
perform for the community that they get the information from. So, uh, and then after that, we go through a process of evaluation and feedback. So just uh, some pictures to show you uh, a project uh, called The Story of the Name. Uh, this is, the, you know, warm up. Uh, next, please. Uh, then they go, we take them for heritage walks so that they find out about, uh, discover from, for themselves the development of the name as a cosmopolitan and multicultural port and city, uh, which is endowed with a wealth of spiritual and artistic uh, traditions. Um, then they learn the gamelan, wayang kulit, and many other uh, performing art instruments, and so on. Um, they also make music with objects and sounds from the environment. Yeah? So, so this helps them to understand that anyone can make music, even, even if you don't have uh, the necessary tools. Yeah? Um, and then they create the multicultural history of Penang with music uh, based on their research. Yeah? So um, this is just a background to Penang, you know, the, the, the story that the children created. Um, that you know, Penang was an important port, so you had many, many settlers you know, come in from Thailand, Burma, India, China, and so on and so forth. And it was an important stopover for Muslim pilgrims um, on their way to Mecca. And so the meeting of different peoples in Penang is manifested in the multiple places of worship, um, names of streets, eclectic food, architecture, different languages, street festivals, and um, performances. Yeah? Um, and then we make them do more research going through um, historical articles or photographs. Okay. Um, they, 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 go, they, they, they do field work where they record music and sound, they interview people. Next, um, they visit temples and mosques. And um, you know, most children in, um, in the place, if you are Chinese, you don't really visit the Indian temple and you don't, uh, you don't visit uh, the Malay mosque. So there's no understanding of one another's uh, uh, religious background. So this helps them to cross boundaries. Eh? Mm -hmm. Next, please. Next, yeah. Um, and so at the end of that, they, they come back and create uh, stories based on the interviews and based on the sounds that they've collected. Um, and they perform uh, for outdoor perform. Uh, they do outdoor performances yeah, for the for the public. So I, I will show you a video clip if I if I can. Yeah. And I come back to that. Yeah. So just some pictures. Hey, wait, 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 wait. Uh, let me just finish first, and then I'll come back. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. So this is a, a, a picture of uh, the kids singing the stories um, that they collected from the uh, community. Yeah. Thanks. Um, a, a, a song about the rap, about the different uh, roads. Yeah. So in Penang, you have roads like called Malay Street, Achin Street, Bangkok Lane, Swatow Lane, which, rep which, which you know, represents the different groups of people uh, who migrated to Penang. So they, they learn about the history of the streets and the people at the same time. Yeah. Uh, but of course, conflicts occurred. So you know, we, we have to talk about secret societies and the conflicts that arose as well. Okay, yeah, and then we get back to the community because they, the children got all the information from the community. We involved the community in the process of research. Um, and the children internalize what they have learned um, through the performance. So um, based on the evaluations, uh, you know, through the many years, we have uh, found out that um, the kids recover the multicultural history and traditions of um, the people of Penang, uh, which you cannot find in the history books because the history books are very geared towards one ethnic group, which is the majority uh, ethnic group. Yeah. So they, um, they, what, what do they say? Uh, many of them say, I thought that traditional music was boring, you know, but now they want to play more there. The history of the uncles and aunties interviewed is different from the school. Yeah. But the people that they interview, the old people, they also have a sense of pride as a result of this interviews that uh, the children have done with them. Next. Um, and so it's a platform for cross-cultural understanding and interaction. Um, they go through different forms of border crossings, which you know I think is very, very important if you want to create uh, peace yeah, or inter-ethnic peace. Um, so inter-ethnic uh, 
co border crossings to adult facilitators and children. You know, mixed. Yeah, we never work in one group only. Uh, we use many languages that um, ordinarily, even in, in Malaysia, we speak. When we speak, we often combine uh, English, Malay, Indian, you know, depending on where we are and who we are talking to. Yeah. So, uh, so the ch the children use the conversations. At the coffee shops, homes, and schools, and the, the languages that they are familiar with. Um, the participants are introduced to different types of indigenous music and theatre, uh, not only from one specific group, but you know, uh, many, many groups. Um, and they interact intensive, intensively with one another for uh, four to six months. Uh, so, in the process, they learn how to negotiate with one another as they have to work very, very closely together. Yeah, next. Um, they, through observing, recording, and executing the movements of playing the music of another ethnic group, then they learn to more about the other and to appreciate the different perspectives. And music and the arts are very important points, I think, for children to cross barriers because they don't think of themselves as Malaysians or Indians when they do theatre or music, you know, but as participants of the workshop. So what do the children say? They are playing games helps us to interact, uh, develop trust, yeah, uh, and among friends of different races, yeah. And no work can be done individually. They have to work as an ensemble. Uh, the Chinese participants say, "Oh, my teammate is the Malay." Explain how Muslims pray at the mosque, yeah? So we learn more about uh, you know, the spiritual aspects. Yeah. Next, uh, uh, the, the Chinese school kids said, "I ah, well, very mixed with other races." Because in the Chinese school, all Chinese, uh, it's all Chinese. Yeah? Now I have the chance to meet. Okay. Um, I think that, that's all. Uh, do, do we have time to play the video? It's just a short three, three minutes. Just three minutes. We do have time. There's a video um, in the folder. It says five. Uh, in the, the back, number five in the first column. Thank <laughs> you. 
the Euro Mediterranean Youth Coral Fair, Coral Crossroad uh, uh, 2011, and uh, here, uh, we, uh, we were with, uh, with our choir participating also, uh, with 10 uh, European and Arab choirs, with over than 400 participants. The great success that this cultural ma uh, manifestations had encouraged the organization of Euro-Arab Youth Music Lab Ethno Jordan in September 2012 in Amman, bring together 40 talented musicians from eight different countries. The common activities were culminated with Euro-Mediterranean Youth Music Expo held in September 2012. All the above activities were funded by EU Culture 2007-2013. So why, why did they choose Limassol? Why Cyprus? Actually, Cypro, uh, at Cyprus, although fully integrated into uh, European structures and being the closest EU member to the Middle East, uh, Cyprus, with her geographical position between three continents, make it an ideal contact point that could provide necessary space for developing and supporting large-scale international projects. Talking about the first steps uh, for uh, this uh, center, the first phase is uh, from 2011 to uh, 2015. The center will contribute to the mapping and creation of a sustainable network of over 100 organizations and companies on an institutional level, working with and or for young people, especially musicians, and young audiences across the EU and Mediterranean. It will also aim to involve, uh, involve in its mobility teams over 3,000 mu uh, young musicians and uh, cultural organizations, music teachers and uh, professionals on the program level, uh, while outreaching an audience of at least uh, 20,000 people through concerts and festivals as well as communications and awareness campaigns. So. Um, this is only what I, I will I will talk about this uh, center. But uh, to talk personally as a young Arab uh, uh, a person who who works uh, not works, uh, who who is related to uh, music, I think this is very important for us because um, uh, first of all, it's, it's like a chance to uh, to spread our uh, our musical uh, heritage and to know more about the European uh, uh, musical heritage. And it's very good also to show um, the real image of, uh, of the Arab uh, uh, youth because uh, if, we will, uh, if we have to wait for the media to give the image of uh, Arab youth, then it will be a catastrophic, I think. So uh, this is our way, the, the, the very cultural and uh, musical uh, way to, uh, to show um, how rich is our heritage, uh, uh, how, uh, how um, active are our uh, youth in the Arab countries. Thank you. So we're handing over now to Eugene Skeet. Um, Eugene, if we go straight to Firefox? Uh, do you want to go to video? Oh, on. Folder and then I think number four in my in the desktop folder. Keep that yeah in the mind. Sorry, thank you. And just this slide. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Whilst they're doing that, may I humbly ask you to just um, massage your faces, please, with your hand. <laughs> just do it like with your hand here. Leave your spectacles on with both hands, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can you, can you do this? Can you try, try this. Fantastic. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
by the Khoi Khoi or San people or Khoi San, the so-called Bushmen of Southern Africa. There are many of them in South Africa, Namibia, Botswana and places like that. And <coughs> originally when they were hunting because of how they revered nature and they respected the animals that they were going to kill for their sustenance, just when they outrun the animal and psyched it out, and David Attenborough, you know the, the man who does those wildlife programs, is fascinated by them. And there's a film that he has on YouTube, so you can check that. With current living so-called Bushmen who have khaki shorts and, and leather belts, you know, and there are other things. And they still do that, where they outrun the animal and they psych it out and they put themselves in the spirit of the animal. And when they're just about to take it, take its life, originally before this board was uh, brought into the story. They would put their mouth, they would crouch like this, or was smaller, put their mouth over here, and then use like overtone chanting, and mesmerize the animal, and the animal would stand there. And that was a way of appeasing the spirit of the animal whose life they were about to take for their sustenance. 
So this inspires a lot of my work, and I'm trying to say that my mother had a significant proportion of the genes from those people. And I was inspired to play today because yesterday I interviewed an Aboriginal man from here, and I was so pleased to meet him. He's uh, at, at the end of the opening ceremony, yesterday he went on stage with his brother, who hadn't been well for many years and was playing the guitar and singing for the first time in 20 years. The one who did the lead singing. The actual musician is the other guy. And I interviewed him and he said to me that uh, music and language are intertwined in his culture. You can't speak of music separate from your identity about your language and your heritage and what have you. And I think we all come from that kind of background, but it's more recent with other people. I come from that cultural background. So all my work is uh, inspired by that kind of story. So when I was growing up in a, in a violent, one of the most violent townships, I've told the story many times, but I'll repeat it because nothing has changed. When I was growing up in a violent uh, township in South Africa, on the outskirts of Durban, in a township called Endunduma, which means thundering hills, because there were many hills and we had tropical, you know, uh, uh, sort of climate and topography like you have here, and there'd be those sudden thunderstorms, you know. And my home was in the midst of that, where each day we went home from school, or even to school from home, we had to walk long distances, take trains and buses, because my parents chose what they thought was a good school for us, which was actually run by German nuns who were very, very cruel to us, and that's another story. But um, uh, along the way, I appeased myself by eating mangoes and you know avocado pears in the territory that belonged to us, but that had been taken over by the colonial people. So on the way back from school, we'd step over black uh, over bodies where people had been killed in one way or another. You know, so that was the kind of environment I grew up in. But my mother's home was the safest place in the whole uh, township, partly because of my father's strength and my mother's uh, uh, healing uh, uh, properties. She was a natural healer, diviner of the traditional kind. So my work in Bosnia and Sudan and various other parts of the world started there. So then when I got to Bosnia, uh, I was invited uh, through people like Nigel Osborne, who uh, Gillian spoke about earlier, and that's, as Gillian said, I met her at the uh, Pavarotti Music Center. I became the uh, director of music development of the place. And just a small story I'd like to share with you that is a continuation of my uh, growing and my travels was I met a man who was also a friend of Gillian's. A, a, a man who was very young, he was you know, one of the youngest people in, on the front line during that war. He's called Orha for short, or, or, Orhan Mashlo. And he became my apprentice and my student. And uh, the, 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 the two instruments I took aside from the djembe, you know the djembe drum, which I play as well, where the berimbau and the udu, this instrument here, which is by the closest instrument to my heart. And it's a clay pot. I've been playing, this one was made by Lisa Gaskin here, but it's a copy of one made by this woman here, uh, who's Victoria Ezia, part of my international udu project. And that was the first instrument I used to bring about a sense of peace, and wholeness uh, uh, among some of the people I met, you know, with the Jambia workshops and all the long things, but the, the special work happened in intimate settings. Am I still here? In intimate settings using that instrument there, which is a women's ceremonial instrument, and I feel honored to be given the permission to play it. And the story is that, uh, is such that when I was there using this instrument, people fell in love with it, not this particular one, my original one, which was a lovely black one. And, uh, when I, was, when I left and I had to leave to go back to London after two years or so, I, uh, the, uh, my friends Oha and another guy called Attila, who Julian also knows, and another musician, who was also my apprentice, did not want me to leave without the Udu. They begged me to leave my first Udu, but it was so special because it was made for me by my wife, and I could not leave it. So I made a, I made a promise that uh, oh, then we, we started looking for potters. I said, if I'm a potter, I can guide the potter how to make an udu, even though I'm not a potter, but I've studied the whole thing, and I, 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 I can show potters how to make it. And we looked, and we couldn't find a potter anywhere. We were in Mostar, the city that uh, uh, Julian spoke of. And then 
in looking for that, we found, you know, like uh, 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 exploded, you know, things, bombshell, what have you, transfer, transpose those into instruments. Uh, Attila's father found us an abattoir, and you know, remember that time, and we, we, we made instruments out of those. But we didn't find the potter. I went back to London, and I said, if you find a potter, I'll come back. And indeed, they found a potter, and called me, took the next flight out. They picked me up in Split, went to Mostar, and the potter was in a very, very remote region, in sheep country, way beyond Sarajevo from, Most from Mostar. It was in deep winter, snow that high, the car had to have chains, and we drove for many, many hours. And found a potter eventually, Avdo Besic, a man who had just sight, you know, synchronously, synchronistically or whatever, found an, a hundred-year-old potter's wheel on his, on, on, on the roof of one of his sheds, which he has to move physically like that. And the first uh, uh, Bosnian Udus, if you like, uh, were made out of that. And uh, we did workshops, recorded music, and if there's time, I'll display this track. But uh, uh, just before you play the track... It's video or the track? No, no the tra your track, actually. On your track on this, yes, yes. Uh, uh, Oha, just to say, has progressed. He was my main sort of... Uh, he was the conduit, he was the gate for me that opened me to, to his society, to his community. And uh, it's a long story, but maybe later in, uh, when we're doing q and I, I can touch on other aspects of it. But basically to say that uh, he, he's a remarkable person now, he runs the rock school, and when, I, when he was given to me, when he was, you know, introduced to me and sent to me actually by Nigel Osborne, I'd forgotten that story, he had problems with speech and communication, what have you, and I'm, uh, I'm very honored to say that he granted me a permission by the kind of friendship we developed to, to actually cultivate his spirit to the point where he was fully himself, you know, and, uh, yeah. That's the story. Thank you. Oh, so, oh, sorry. And this this piece of music is from when we were going to seek the the, the potter, and 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 uh, Attila wanted to get an instrument called a jumbush, which is the string instrument. It's an old Tur Turkish instrument. Yeah, you know the name, brother. Yeah. And and yeah. Sorry, I'm just asking out of ignorance. Yes, yeah. Sorry. So do you want to, do you want to say something about it? It's a threatless danger. Thank you. And, and, and there was a, a famous musician who had the only one that uh, they could find in that region and he, w he had started to have a, uh, what do you call it, uh, an antique, like a museum of, of, of ancient instruments and wouldn't part with it. And Attila asked us to stop and I charmed the guy to sell it to him, but he was so charmed he gave it to him for free. <laughs> and the, the, the rhythm that you'll hear on, on my Udu as we are going to search for the Udu was my little meditation you know, to help us go through the snow. And when, when Attila got the, the, the jumbush and it was missing a string or two, to my rhythm, he, he strummed the riff that you'll hear on, on this. And then I brought them through my charity to London and we recorded an album and they did music, uh, community music work, where they were bringing their culture to schools and communities in the UK. So that's the track called Jumbush. Thank you. It takes a while to start up. Push the volume up a bit.
beautiful. And I know listening to that, I felt all the different layers of stories that we've been hearing this morning. And so now we want to open it to, to discussion with all of you. We've heard about, um, we've heard from Eugene a story that starts very personally and is also tells us a story of, a, of, a, of an individual life that was transformed, if you like, through through the you know the bringing in of, of a, a music of musical opportunities, but also relationships, also friendship, also access to new ideas. We've also heard about a an institution, a new institution, one that's designed to bring people together who are, are, who as a, as a forum, a space for sharing ideas. Um, people who are geographically quite close to each other, but but um, culturally um, diverse, and also I think through. Um, the structures of the way that our world is organised, not necessarily in uh, having many opportunities to come together um, to make music, to play music, to share ideas and share experiences and find all that they have in common. And in the country itself, that is also one with a divided heritage. We've also heard about a project that is, in a way, a kind of um, almost like an insurance plan against the you know the potential for future tension, an environment where. Um, there, where people live together and yet separately and don't necessarily know very much about each other and the role that music and, and the arts can play and also collaborative working and, and create creative, imaginative exploration of, of shared history can be used as vehicles to build that um, familiarity and trust that acts in a way as a buffer or additional resilience when future um, volatility may render the community again at risk of, of riots as we heard about. And then all of that in the context of a lot of other really interesting work that is taking place, that um, often very challenging work, um, and that works often with very limited resources. So that's the environment that we've really set up for you, but now what we'd like to hear from you is um, any questions you have either about the specific projects or about more general themes that arise for you as you've listened to um, what we've had to say this morning. Um, Deborah, Deborah Parker is our colleague from um, uh, Italy, but also working um, in Lebanon in one of the Palestinian refugee camps there. So she'll be speaking tomorrow, but Deborah, please. I just wanted to say, I haven't actually met Paula uh, yet, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk. Your, we'll talk. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm eager. But um, no, one of your sentences really struck hard with me, which was towards the end, your personal comment, where you talked about the fact that uh, you made a plea uh, for a, an appeal for the Arab image in the rest of the world. And uh, certainly my work in Lebanon has uh, brought me to uh, begin to understand the Arab uh, identity and uh, who the Arabs are, and, or who a little part of the Arabs are. Uh, I think... Can you use this? Yeah, just so close to the facts. So close to the about this part. Okay, okay. Okay, is that better? <laughs> um, uh, what Rula said was that if, the, if we leave it to the media to uh, give us an image of what the Arab culture is like, it's never going to happen or it's going to happen badly. Uh, I think she's right, from what I know of the Palestinians particularly and the Lebanese and the Arab culture, I think she's absolutely right. But I would extend that to the whole world. I think the media is getting it wrong in nearly every uh, aspect of everybody's cultural identity and who human beings on the earth are. And I think they're getting it wrong because I don't think the media is out to, uh, to obtain the same objectives as we are. I think the media has different objectives and they are connected to power and control and uh, conditioning. And what we are all committed to, I think, is um, creativity and individuality and the richness of all, what all of us can uh, give to humanity because we are all humans. It doesn't matter where we are and which boundaries we live within, we are actually all humans. And so I think probably um, music is just incredibly important for that because where people can come together and make music together, uh, what we find is our commonness, our um, you know togetherness. And uh, and I think uh, we we need to follow this through in all cultures, including the Arab, but in all cultures of the whole world. I'm perfectly certain that I have a lot of conditioning. We all have a lot of conditioning about a lot of peoples that we don't know anything about, and music is one of the best ways of coming into contact and sharing. Um, the microphone is, um, is probably extends about a little bit further, but um, so if you're further, towards the back if you have a question, do feel perfectly comfortable walking forward and, and taking hold. Oh no, some of this actually got quite a long lead. So do I have uh, more questions? Yes, thank you. It's maybe a question to your, to your remarks. Um, 
because I, I was thinking, could it be then, because the media often mix up um, culture and religion, um, why we will spot more music as a part, as an art, partly, and of course music also is a part of our culture, but this is my, my own uh, thinking, that, that, that the media probably don't, don't make the difference between, they always talk about culture, <coughs> but present it as a kind of religion, or the other way around, that they talk about religion and present it as the Arab culture. And I think there is the source of the misunderstanding. Would you like to respond? Yes. Yeah, um, I, I think probably there's another uh, ambiguity as well. You know, the media talk about religion, but I don't think they're really talking about religion. I don't think they're really talking about what is at the base of every big uh, religion or small religion in the world. So, you know, I think uh, what we're getting to and what Rula touched on, and which I think touched something very deep in me, is that when you're when you are making music together, you're not talking. You know the messages are moving in a different kind of way. They're not moving in cliches and and uh, common ideas and uh, yeah boundaries. So uh, even religion and power and uh, and the differences and nationalities are, are not there. I think music is something very very wondrous from that point of view. But it was interesting because we were together in a panel yesterday, and then she said that women are not allowed to sing alone, yeah. and then that's why you yeah. started the choir, but maybe you should yeah. tell it yourself. You, you are right because, yes, uh, uh, the media like mix uh, between Arab and uh, religion, and especially the, the Islam. And uh, uh, in our uh, travels and trip with the choir, we discovered that uh, um, a lot of um, Western people think like, Arabs are all Muslims, and Muslims are, are all terrorists. <laughs> Yeah, we discovered that, and uh, and this is exactly what I was uh, saying about the center. The one of the, uh, for me, the the, the best important uh, uh, achievements of this uh, this uh, this center is that we can show another the real image, not uh, the real uh, image that uh, that uh, we have. And also, I have um, an example I want to talk about in 2005. Uh, Faiha Choir went to Poland, to Warsaw, to uh, participate in Warsaw International Choir Festival. It was a competition, and for us it was like a dream to uh, to travel and to uh, and to participate in a competition. So we were the only Arab uh, choir there, and when we arrived, we were like treated very, very, very badly from the people there, from all the choir, from all the world, and. And it was, but we didn't blame them because we we knew before what they think about Arab uh, people. So um, uh, they were we, we were really treated very bad uh, um, before coming on stage, after singing, and we and we took the second prize in this uh, competition. And then in, 2000, in 2007 we we got the first prize in the same uh, competition as a choir and as a conductor, but. This is what I want to say. So, uh, when we when we sing, when we sang, when when they heard our uh, music, when when they saw how organized we are on the stage, they were like, okay, <laughs> they they started uh, changing uh, their minds. And uh, um, exactly, this is why why we are uh, working like this. This is why we need uh, the uh, this uh, project and. Uh, uh, thanks God that we, we have in our country one umbrella for the in the in the music uh, sector, which is uh, good and very meant because we need more. But um, and the Arab Academy of Music, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the partners for the center, is trying to do this, and um, we are waiting for more uh, good academic uh, projects like this. Thank you for your comments. As some on the wrong side of 60 now, um, I've been very lucky to travel a lot, and we were together in the result, and Enat, your colleague, is now on our board, and on the board of the European Music Council. Uh, I think one of the saddest things, I would slightly disagree with what you said, not the music as a communication tool, but when the music is with words, it's even more powerful. And it's, it's really sad now that so often, 
most recently we had a contemporary music festival in Scotland. I'm head of music at Creative Scotland and fund Nigel a lot in what he does. Um, and don't want to read about it in the media. We do it because we should do it. Um, and we had a group of musicians from Syria. Surprise, surprise, they didn't get in to Scotland just a few weeks ago. Um, and it's the determination is your name, your country of birth, or where in the world there is a perceived conflict at any given time. And with great respect to my colleagues in America, uh, we have family in the States. They are, depending on how you look at it, the best or the worst at interpreting a name on a passport. And wouldn't it be fantastic if on your passport it said musician? And then there was approved an approved stamp where the name, the country of origin was not important. So you went through passport control. He, she, they are fine. They are musicians. They are bringing, you know, let's not get too, uh, uh, too dewy-eyed about this. They're bringing peace and love, but they're bringing great music. And it's the same when you are part of a great performance. You don't go away saying that was great Arabic music. You're always saying that was great music. We had a great experience. And I'd like to see far more of that attitude and less of the other stuff that we read about. Thanks, Anne. Probably don't need a microphone to speak in space this size and for anybody who knows me, but <laughs> uh, so here we go, as you know. Hi, I'm Phil Mullen and uh, I'm involved in community music and I'm on the tomorrow's panel. Um, I want to go on a slightly different tack now and, and go for a minute or two, if I may, on these issues which I've talked to some of the people here about before, which is this field or this number of intersecting fields, because it really it wasn't just music and conflict, in fact, this uh, work that you're doing, a wonderful work, wonderful, beautiful work. But it actually is, it, it, it cuts across a whole range of different fields, as does your own, you know, personal development, youth development, a whole range of different, different things. Um, it's something very dear to our hearts, and there's a generation of people out there doing it. And in the field of music and conflict particularly, it's the doers, as Gillian said at the start, that are visible. And the people who are doing it are visible. And, and I think there's a crisis. If we wanted to think now, well, what are we now, 2013, so if we went 2063, yeah, we would just put it 50 years ahead. You know, with the best will in the world, guys, you know, you may be, I'm sure you may be, you may be, I don't know, but I won't be, yeah? So, okay, so there's a couple of us won't be doing it. So there's issues about sustainability, there's issues about development, yeah? And there's big, big issues in this field. And there's issues about documentation. Hats off to Gillian for getting that process that you've done so well in that. But I think we have a crisis of thought in this field because the work is so urgent and needs to be done, that we'll go and do it. You know, that we'll put the plaster on it, and that's not, your work is well beyond the plaster, don't get me wrong, but it's great work. But we, we music activists, need to be active doing the music. And then we look around behind, there's nobody there. You know, there's no institutions behind us. There's no governments behind us, you know. We, there may be bits and pieces, but it's bits and pieces, it's piecemeal. If this work is important, there needs to be a united, global coming together of the people who believe in it, who do it, who want to research it, who want to make it develop and be seen for the, the truly powerful work that it is on so many levels. <coughs> I would like to see this event start that process. Thank you, Phil. That leads me to a question that occurred to me as I was listening to um, my fellow panellists speaking about sustainability. Both um, Rula and um, Sui Bang mentioned the training. Um, Sui Bang in particular, I picked up that um, some of the people who are involved in leading the workshops are people who've taken part in the past. So I wonder if we could just sort of briefly speak about how uh, that question of sustainability and the ability for an intervention to continue beyond the time that of its initial, often at the beginning there's a lot of energy and a lot, often there's a lot of funding as well. Um, but there's a lot of energy definitely. And that's often when the um, international people are there, or the experts or the specialists. But one of the usual goals is that there will be some kind of legacy and certainly some kind of um, capacity building that takes place in the location. So the work can continue on its own steam and on its own terms 
really being driven by the people who live there. Um, so perhaps could we, would we each like to speak on that um, a moment? Because I know Eugene has done a lot in training as well. And with that goal to thinking about what happens later um, beyond the initial time period of intervention. So again, we could start with you. Um, yeah, I think that, um, you know, as, as uh, scholars and, and researchers, we are actually uh, helping in intervention, but we, we are maybe not part of the community. And for any project to be sustainable, the community must feel that they are engaged and they must feel that they own the project. Otherwise, I don't think, you know, it will last. So, um, in, in, in many uh, cases in Southeast Asia, there are a lot of NGOs involved in the work with uh, musicians and uh, which deal with other you know, uh, projects, uh, which deal with other topics as well, you know, other issues. So what they do is that it's very important to train uh, you know, the community and involve them in all aspects of the project, including the planning you know, of the whole project, uh, the process of the working and so on, uh, right from the beginning, so that uh, when when these NGO activists leave or musicians, musical activists leave, then the community can actually take over. Then only will it be sustainable. Yeah. So so in, in my case, um, I, we not only train our students, but um, there are all these children who are at different stages uh, of, the, of uh, training, so the older kids will be involved in the training of uh, the younger ones as well. Yeah. And we always involve the community in all aspects. Uh, well, I think in our case it's uh, different because you are, we are thinking about like an institution. And thank you for asking because I forgot to to tell about the the building, the music center building. Pro, uh, it's the proposal. If anyone is interested, we can have it. If anyone is interested on uh, also uh, financing this building. <laughs> Um, so um, now, in this in this project, you are talking about um, three very big partners. You are talking about the Arab Academy of Music, uh, about the, the Arab League uh, uh, states, so uh, and uh, the um, and the EPROE movement of EPROE in Cyprus are uh, really very good. Actually, you you know Nenad, he's, he's a very motivated and active uh, person. And Janes Musical is, uh, is well, wide, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, um, I think sustain sustainability here um, um, is um, um, it's it's about the, how big is, are these partners, how how uh, um, uh, how strong they are, and uh, I think we we, we have hope <laughs> to uh, to continue, uh, especially with the motivation and. Uh, um, and the, um, how to say, um, the motivation of all the partners. I don't know if Mr. Hisham has something to add to this uh, matter of sustainability. What? Thank you. Uh, most important, you know, this, uh, this project, uh, the last project we do it in Lebanon, um, uh, Music and Harmony, uh, funded by uh, European Union and uh, Arab Academy of Music and uh, Catholic University. We bring three choral from Hungary and uh, Germany and Cyprus with 18 religion in Lebanon. Uh, Sunni, Shia, uh, Protestants, uh, Arthur, uh, Syrian Orthodox, Arman. And it's very nice that uh, at the end of this project, all of them on the stage uh, sing one song. Uh, Christian and Islamic and Dulzi and I think it's most important that this project uh, we can do it another place and maybe in Africa they have the same problem different religion different region and uh, I think the Arab Academy music is new project for them that is not easy and you, you, you can see the first time. Our representative is woman. It's not easy that you feel that in Arab country our representative is woman. But I think we have new generation in Arab country, and we have we think that the next project uh, managed by by Rula or Fatma, and I think uh, 
this is very challenging and out of country. Thank you very much. Challenges, but I think they're getting impression it's a good challenge. It's a good a good challenge for the to be putting forward and, and letting people see that it works. Okay. Um, Eugene, did you would, would you like to speak yes. a little bit more about your experiences as a trainer? Um, my experience as a trainer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I I find the question of sustainability a very difficult one, and I'm speaking personally because of maybe. Um, an incorrect interpretation of it, but I, I see uh, at least two kinds of sustainability. When I, when, when I was forced to leave my country where I worked with people, as someone you may have known, you may have heard of Steve Beagle, I, I, I was forced to leave because what we were doing challenged you know, the regime, but it was no different to the work that we are talking about. And we did it with no money. It was not a cent to get. I built a school with my bare hands, with my university colleagues, literally from ground up, and taught in it with no money. And some of those ideas were the, were, were the foundation for a lot of the uh, progressive change that happened in that country. When I was forced to leave, I was surprised uh, that, that, that uh, uh, just to change the tax slightly, that artists, you know, so a lot of artists I met in, in, in London, in the UK, would almost not be able to function without the grant, you know, that, that, that artistic expression was uh, predicated upon getting an Arts Council grant or a London Arts Board or various things, you know, and I don't put into those things, but for many, many years, uh, it, it confused me. Another thing that confused me is that, another slight digression, but that's relevant here, is when uh, something, we were responsible, myself and other Africans, for the formation of the Combined Arts Department, because people didn't know how to uh, pigeonhole what we're doing. So, against that backdrop, what I'd like to say is that when I, when I went to Bosnia, and I, I, I'll, I'll stick with my friend Oha, I spoke of, you know, that uh, uh, there was no money a lot of time, uh, sometimes there was money, sometimes not money, but that was neither here nor there for me. The kind of sustain, the second kind of, kind of sustainability that I saw, that I experienced in my work with Oha, training uh, those guys, was that the spirit, the, the, the resilience, and, 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 and uh, we reached a level where come rain or you know sunshine, what they believe in will, will, will see them through. And I don't want to be misunderstood as saying we don't need funding or we don't need government support or whatever, but I'm saying it, it, uh, we mustn't lose sight of the fact that the fight, uh, I, I'm not very uh, optimistic about, their, about the kind of change I, I'm with Phil Mullen on, on saying we need to, you know, get be able to look back and see that we have, we have somebody. But I'm kind of almost like uh, 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 I don't want to look back. Actually, I just want to, you know, go. It doesn't make sense. Thank you. And I would say that um, we the just thinking that it's interesting. That there's always going to be this um, tension, if you like, in any uh, development situation or humanitarian situation when lots of money comes in, it can also create a, a very quickly a dependence that activity only happens when there's money and people stop doing things when there's no money. I was in Mostar just uh, in the last few weeks um, speaking to people there about their experiences of music in that um, post-conflict recovery um, period, uh, which still continues in a way today um, because recovery is very long and a slow process. But one of the interesting things was talking to some of the music teachers about their lamenting of the fact that there's no orchestra in Mostar and there's no orchestra because there's no money and this was said over and over again and, and at some point I said, you know, in, in Australia it's obviously a very different environment but of course we have many musicians who just get together and play and they play because they love to play and they put on concerts and, and they do that, you know, sometimes they'll contribute their own funds but often if it's a smaller group then it will be self-sustaining and, and in a way we know through community music research, such as the sound leaks research that came out of this institution a couple of years ago, that music, community music has a great potential to be very self-sustaining and um, self-driving um, without a great need for external forces. So it's an interesting dilemma, I think, that uh, as we go in, as um, the outs are going, outside are going in and being able to stimulate some really amazing creative activity, we also have this responsibility to be aware that um, this is something that also can be generated locally. And so what we're looking at is, is ensuring that we don't create that um, that dependence that needs things only 
start to happen, if there's money behind them. And I'm just mindful of the time, Deborah, because I feel like I, it's, we're right on 10.30. We have another discussion tomorrow. We hope that we'll see many of you there again. But please, those of you who have time to stick around, please do, and we'll continue the conversation. But for now, I'll just invite you to thank um, all the panellists for their contributions this morning, and um, we hope to see many of you again tomorrow. Thank you very much. For your